Uh, from Cranston, Rhode Island, born and raised, haven't left. I'm 44 years old now. Um, I was 35 at the time of the fire, living at home with my two sons, um, Alex and Nick. I was dating someone um, that I had met through a dating website. His name was Freddie Chrysostomy, and life was good. Fred was a great guy. He taught me pretty much everything about like sports and you know like how to pretty much be a man and be respectful. Rock has been my very big love for a very long time. Started with the Rolling Stones. Just a passion for it. While I was in my marriage, kind of went to the wayside for a little bit. He wasn't into that kind of music. Um, but then met Fred and jumped right back on the bandwagon. <laughs> I never knew my mom as the type of lady that would go out to a club and listen to rock music. Coming from a mother of two who just did nothing but read. Even now, like, the one thing, the one thing she wanted for Christmas was, like, the Kindle. Like, that's all she does is read. I never knew she was in the clubs. For me, going to the station on February 20th was probably only about the fifth time I had been there. It was fun, it was local, and they played live music. It was all about live music at that point. Um, anyone that played live rock, we were going. Once they said Great White was going to be taking the stage, it truly was body to body, shoulder to shoulder. You couldn't turn around, you couldn't twist around. Um, there were a lot of people. Great White came out, uh, Jack Russell said, said a few words, um, trying to get the crowd going, and they started into the song Desert Moon, and all of a sudden the pyrotechnics went up. Because of where we were standing, Fred had said to me, look at that, something's wrong. There's a fire, there's something on fire. And there was a fire exit, maybe three, four steps to my right, to our right. And Fred just grabbed my hand and we went over to the fire exit. And we got to that fire exit and there was a bouncer standing in the door, in front of the door. And Fred is screaming, there's a fire, open the door, there's a, you know, a fire. And the bouncer just stood there and said, no, the door was for the band only, that it was club policy. We got a few steps without it being this mad rush, but then I think all of a sudden it's when the rest of the crowd realized at this point half the ceiling is on fire, the lights are starting to shatter from the heat. Um, it was just, it looked like a stampede, something out of a National Geographic. It was just, let's go to that door. If you came in it, you knew that door. Fred's hand was on my back at one point, and all I remember was him pushing me and screaming, go. And when I tried to turn around to find him, all I saw were a sea of people and their heads were on fire. It was melting black rain, what I call black rain. Glass was shattering everywhere and people's heads were on fire and Fred was nowhere. And when he pushed me, he pushed me so hard that I actually got made it to the front doorway. But at that point, I was stuck. I was wedged in between other people. And I can remember looking and around and thinking, I'm done, my life is over, my breaths were getting shorter and shorter, it was getting hotter and hotter to breathe, the smoke was just, it was just black smoke. And the last thing I remember is hitting the hardwood floor in the club. And that, that's my last memory of being in the club. I was about six years old when the state the fire happened. My grandma got a call and she told me and my brother. I heard everyone in the house, you know, screaming, yelling, like getting all mad. And I, I just, I it was only nine, so I didn't get out of my bed. And uh, they had my grandma had told me that she didn't feel good, so she was going to the hospital. But I knew they were lying. It wasn't until the next morning that they actually had told me. quickly ran out of bed space you know our, our burn service was already pretty busy and we didn't have any you know empty beds so we got uh, beds in the surgical ICUs and the medical ICUs and 
um, you know, all intensive care units throughout the hospital that would allow us to uh, put burn patients there. And I called the uh, Shriners, and they have a, a wonderful hospital here, licensed for children, and asked if we could uh, put adults here. And they uh, very kindly said yes, you know, it's an emergency, and they'd be happy to do that, which is really uh, wonderful. And uh, to my knowledge, it's the first adult admissions that have ever uh, come into Shriners. I met Gina on the day or the morning after the fire. Um, I met her. She didn't actually meet me until a few years later. Um, Gina was in a medically induced coma. I assisted with her care and worked pretty closely with um, taking care of her and working with her family as well. Gina's injuries were quite extensive. Um, she did have third and fourth degree burns, which um, burns down through the skin to bone um, and fat as well. Um, some of the most extensive burns that I've seen um, in my 10 years here. You know, burn patients die for three reasons. During the first, you know, 24 hours, they die of burn shock. They lose a lot of fluid through their wounds and their blood pressure goes lower and lower. The next reason uh, burn patients will die is from infection. Uh, their wounds get infected. There's a lot of dead skin and fat and muscle in their wounds. And then the third reason uh, patients will die is from respiratory failure. If they've inhaled a lot of uh, bad smoke and they basically can slough the lining of their lungs and their lungs no longer will give them enough oxygen. And so uh, respiratory support's an important component of uh, taking care of patients like uh, Gina with, uh, uh, with a smoke inhalation injury. So those three things sort of, sort of happen all together. I woke up 11 weeks later from a medically induced coma. I remember, I remember asking where Fred was, and I just, at that point, was rational enough to say, okay, if I'm alive but injured, maybe he is too. And she said to me, well, he's not here. Fred's not here. And I said, well, what hospital is he in? And she said, no, he's not here. He died. He died in the club. We follow these patients from the day they're brought in till the day they're brought out. Uh, we get very close to the families, we get very close to the patients themselves, and they become part of your family. So a lot of it is from the heart because you know you get to know them so well and that's an important key piece to it, I think. This fire happened for a reason. 100 people could not have died for nothing. Um, or 200 and some odd of us could not be burned for no reason at all. I need people to know that this tragedy happened. We're surviving, and I'm surviving well. I'm very fortunate and very blessed to, to have the people that I have in my life because of this fire. Um, but I don't ever want the world to forget that 100 incredible people died for a lot of crazy reasons, stuff that should never have happened. There were no sprinklers in the building. Um, exits didn't work properly. We can't forget that. We have to fix the problems before it happens again.